from World News Tonight. Historic step. After a year and a half long investigation, the January 6th panel calls for Trump to face insurrection criminal charges. Hidden wave. China fights to hide the true number of COVID deaths as virus rips through Beijing. Turmoil at Twitter. A poll posted by Elon Musk showcased stunning results. Will Musk abide by the outcome? And Christmas regatta. Dozens of Santa Claus swapped their beloved sleighs for gondolas as they rode along Venice's canals. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Nearly two years after the deadly capital riot, the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack accused former President Donald J. Trump of inciting insurrection, conspiracy to defraud the United States, obstruction of an act of Congress and one other federal crime as it referred him to the Justice Department for potential prosecution. The U.S. House of Representatives Committee investigating the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol on Monday asked federal prosecutors to charge Donald Trump with obstruction and insurrection for his role in sparking the deadly riot. The criminal referral for a former president, the first such recommendation from Congress in U.S. history, came at the final public gathering of the nine-member panel that spent 18 months probing the unprecedented attempt to prevent the peaceful transfer of power by thousands of Trump backers. Inspired by his false claims that the 2020 election loss to Democratic President Joe Biden was the result of widespread fraud. The panel asked the Justice Department to charge Trump with obstruction of an official proceeding of Congress, conspiracy to defraud the United States, making false statements and aiding or inciting an insurrection. The select committee approved its report, including the recommendation of charges unanimously, with all of its seven Democrats and two Republicans in favor. Those in favor say aye. 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 The Justice Department is not bound by the recommendations, but they may increase pressure on prosecutors to bring a criminal case against Trump and some of his allies. Representative Liz Cheney, one of the Republicans on the panel, was defeated in a primary by a pro-Trump candidate. Yet she remained strident in her condemnation of the former president and on Monday related witness testimony that Trump spent hours watching the January 6th attack play out on television, ignoring pleas from aides and allies to call for an end to the violence. Five people, including a police officer, died during or shortly after the riot, and more than 140 police officers were injured. The Capitol suffered millions of dollars in damage. The committee also referred four Republican House members, including Republican leader Kevin McCarthy, to the Chamber's Ethics Committee for failing to comply with its legal subpoenas as it investigated the attack. The committee's request to the Justice Department comes as a special counsel is overseeing two other federal probes of the Republican former president related to his attempt to overturn his 2020 election defeat and the removal of classified files from the White House. We will make America glorious again. Trump has already launched a campaign to seek the Republican nomination to run for the White House again in 2024. Thailand's military deployed warships and helicopters to try to locate 33 Marines missing after COVID sank overnight in choppy waters in the Gulf of Thailand. Three Navy vessels and two helicopters were sent to find the missing off the south of Bangkok after the HTMS Sukhothai warship suffered an engine malfunction and went down just before midnight about 20 nautical miles off the coast. Warships and helicopters scoured the choppy waters of the Gulf of Thailand on Monday in an effort to locate 33 Marines missing after a warship sank overnight. The Thai Navy deployed three of its vessels and two helicopters to find the missing off Prachuap Kiri Khan province, south of Bangkok. The corvette they were aboard, the HTMS Sukhothai warship, suffered an engine malfunction and went down just before midnight, about 20 nautical miles off the coast. An overnight rescue mission in bad weather secured 73 of the 106 people aboard, the Navy said but the remaining 33 were forced to abandon ship. The Navy posted images on its Twitter account showing a group of personnel on an inflatable raft moving away from a ship in darkness as waves swirled around it. 
it was not immediately clear how many rafts had been deployed. The US-built Sukhothai has been in use since 1987. It was hit by strong waves on Sunday, forcing it to tilt to one side before becoming flooded with seawater. President Vladimir Putin of Russia made a rare visit to Belarus to strengthen his bond with the country's president and his closest regional ally Alexander Lukashenko, a fellow strongman who has been under growing pressure from Moscow to provide more support for the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian officials said the capital city of Kyiv suffered additional strikes, although those explosions appeared to cause no fatalities despite causing damage to critical infrastructure. As Russian President Vladimir Putin touched down in Belarus on Monday, Ukrainian fears rose that he would pressure ally and counterpart Alexander Lukashenko to open a new front in the war. It's Putin's first visit to the country since 2019. Still, in a joint news conference, the pair hardly mentioned the war at all. Both Lukashenko and Putin also dismissed fears from Belarus's largely silenced political opposition about a creeping Russian absorption of its much smaller neighbor. Russia is not interested in absorbing anyone, Putin said. It just doesn't make any sense. Lukashenko has repeatedly said his country will not be drawn into the war. Although Russian forces used Belarus as a launch pad for an attack on Kyiv in February, and there has been Russian and Belarusian military activity there for months. Russian troops that moved to Belarus in October will conduct battalion tactical exercises, Russia's Interfax news agency reported, citing the defense ministry. It was not immediately clear when they would start. U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said the two leaders' track record spoke for itself. Look, I think a statement like that uh, has to be treated as the height of irony, uh, coming from uh, a leader who is seeking at the present moment right now uh, to violently absorb uh, his other uh, peaceful next-door neighbor. The meeting comes as Russia hit key energy infrastructure in and around Kyiv in a so-called kamikaze drone attack. Ukrainian officials said air defenses shot down 23 of 28 drones, most over the capital. No casualties have been reported from the strikes. Monday's attack marked the third Russian airstrike in less than a week and the latest in a series over the past few months, targeting Ukraine's power grid, causing sweeping blackouts during sub-zero temperatures. In his nightly address on Sunday, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said his country was ready for all possible scenarios with Russia and its ally Belarus. Putin calls the invasion a special military operation to denazify Ukraine. It's the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. Cities have been reduced to ruins, tens of thousands have been killed, and millions driven from their homes in the 10-month-old conflict. Estonian Prime Minister Kaya Kallas confirmed continued support for Ukraine at the meeting of the leaders of the countries belonging to the Joint Expeditionary Force held in Riga. The meeting focused on strengthening security in the Baltic Sea, the North Atlantic and the Far North. According to Kallas, the past year signifies the importance of the force. A UK-led group of 10 northern European nations has pledged to further help Ukraine defend itself from Russian aggression. The Joint Expeditionary Force was set up to accelerate a common response to Russian threats. During a meeting in Riga, the Latvian capital, assembled leaders heard a plea from the Ukrainian president for more weapons. I ask you to increase the supply of air defense systems to our state and to help speed up the relevant decisions of partners. A 100% air defense shield for Ukraine will be one of the most successful steps against Russian aggression. This step is needed right now. The British Prime Minister supported Zelensky's view that rather than talk of a ceasefire, Ukraine needs to push ahead with its counteroffensive. We must continue to focus on degrading Russia's capability to regroup and to resupply. And, and that means going after its supply chains and removing the international support. Particularly, I'm thinking of Iran and the weapons that it's currently providing to Russia. The increased supply of high-tech Western weapons to Ukraine has played a large part in the country's battlefield successes in recent months. But maintaining that level of support is a major challenge for the West, especially given the economic disruption the war has caused and higher electricity prices consumers are facing. 
Now, nations have agreed to protect a third of the planet for their nature by 2030 in a landmark deal aimed at safeguarding biodiversity. There will also be targets for protecting vital ecosystems such as rainforests and wetlands and the rights of indigenous peoples. The agreement at the COP15 UN Biodiversity Summit in Montreal, Canada. A historic deal has been reached at the COP15 Biodiversity Conference in Montreal. The most significant part of the agreement is a commitment to protect 30% of land and water by 2030. Currently, 17% of terrestrial and 10% of marine areas are protected. This is a historical moment. Today, we are approaching the end of a long journey, which involved numerous meetings in different parts of the world. During this journey, we even pushed forward our work at the height of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Now, we have finally reached our destination. The draft calls for the raising of around 200 billion euros by 2030 for biodiversity from a range of sources. Countries will also continue to phase out or reform environmentally damaging subsidies, such as those used to reduce the price of petrol. This could also provide another 500 billion euros for nature. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. There are growing doubts about the official number of COVID deaths that China is declaring. Evidence of a new wave is beginning to emerge in Beijing, with long queues forming at crematoriums. China has declared just eight deaths from COVID in the past seven months, but after its zero COVID policy was dropped, the virus is spreading rapidly in Beijing. On Monday, China officially reported its first COVID-related deaths since the government began scrapping strict antivirus controls earlier this month. Though the National Health Commission only declared two deaths, they were the first reported since early December and fed into worries this could be the start of a grim trend as the virus rips through the country. Locals said there'd been a rise in demand for cremations and hearses could be seen packing out a crematorium parking lot on Sunday. For now, residents said they weren't too worried despite the surge in infections. It can't be avoided. If you get it, you get it. If you're infected, it depends on the individual's health whether you are well or not. We try as far as it's possible to not spread it to the elderly and children. That's all I can say. Officially, China has suffered less than 5,240 COVID-linked deaths over the pandemic, a tiny fraction of its 1.4 billion population and very low by global standards. As the country struggles to reopen amidst a surge of infections, authorities scaled up door-to-door -door COVID shots for the elderly. State media showed footage of health workers vaccinating senior citizens in their homes in Sichuan and Guizhou provinces. Officially, China's vaccination rate is above 90 percent, but the rate for boosted adults drops to under 58 percent, according to government data. With COVID curbs lifted, health experts warn the country could be left with over 1.5 million deaths from the virus. The UK government's plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda is legal. Two High Court judges have ruled in a victory for backers for the controversial policy. But the judges also said that governments failed to consider the individual circumstances of the people it tried to deport, signalling further legal battles ahead. Britain's High Court has ruled that a government plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda is legal. In April, the UK struck a deal with the African nation, allowing for some asylum seekers' applications to be processed in Rwanda with applicants residing there. Even if successful, those sent there would continue to have the right to reside in Rwanda, but not the UK. The policy has been criticised due to the poor nature of human rights in Rwanda when compared to Britain, and whether the policy would actually be cost-effective. Under the plans, asylum seekers were to be sent to this hostel in the Rwandan capital. So far, no one has been deported as part of the policy. The UK was forced to cancel the first deportation flight at the last minute in June after the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the plan carried a real risk of irreversible harm. 
This is despite Britain paying Rwanda over 140 million euros as part of the deal. While the court has ruled in the government's favour, it added that it must consider the circumstances of each case before deporting anyone, thus setting the controversial policy up for further legal battles. The South African president Cyril Ramaphosa has been re-elected as leader for the ruling African National Congress for a second five-year term in party leadership contest. Votes cast by delegates at the party conference gave Ramaphosa a clear victory over his rivals Veli Minkize, a former party treasurer and health minister. This is the sound of the crowd cheering after South African President Cyril Ramaphosa was re-elected as the leader of the governing African National Congress on Monday a move which paves way for him to contest the presidency again at 2024 elections. Ramaphosa's political future had been hanging in the balance earlier in December after the so-called Farmgate scandal. A panel of experts found preliminary evidence he may have violated the constitution over a stash of foreign currency hidden at his private game farm. He has denied wrongdoing and challenged the report in court. Ramaphosa has not been charged with any crime, but some opponents have called for his resignation. The president beat former health minister Zweli Mkhize in a ballot at a party gathering in Johannesburg, securing a second five-year term as ANC leader and suggesting continuity in economic policy. Ramaphosa won around 57% of the votes against Mkhize's 43%. South Africa's RAND, banking stocks and local sovereign bonds made gains after Ramaphosa's win. South Africa's next general election is due in 2024, following which parliament will choose the president. The ANC has won majority of seats at every vote since multiracial elections began in 1994. Sudanese security forces have fired tear gas and stun grenades to disperse protesters who have commemorated in Khartoum the fourth anniversary of the December 2018 revolution that topped dictator Omar Hassan al-Bashir. Sudanese security forces used stun grenades and tear gas on Monday to disperse crowds of protesters. They were rallying in Khartoum on the fourth anniversary of the uprising that toppled former leader Omar al-Bashir. The protests in the capital come two weeks after the military leaders, who staged a coup last year, signed an outline deal with political parties to relaunch a transition towards democratic elections with international support. The deal faces major challenges, though. Analysts say they include limited public backing for the civilian signatory and the deferral of contentious issues, including transitional justice and reform of the security forces. Demonstrators who called for civilian rule and justice over the deaths during past protests gathered in their largest numbers for several months on Monday. They marched to within about a mile of the presidential palace. One of them is Al Jamri. The revolution will continue and will not stop. Our basic demand is to live a decent life in this country and we will not give up our rights in any way. Even if agreements were signed between politicians and soldiers, this is not what the Sudanese people want. Police with armoured trucks blocked their way, then chased the protesters through the streets. Rallies were also reported in other Sudanese cities. Ahead of the protest, security forces had closed roads leading to the defence ministry and shut several of the bridges linking Khartoum with its adjoining cities. Since October 2021, when military leaders deposed a civilian-led government that had been set up under a power-sharing arrangement, more than 120 civilians have been killed by security forces at anti-military protests, according to medics. Authorities have said that peaceful protests are allowed and that protest casualties will be investigated. Twitter users voted decisively in a poll for Elon Musk to step down as chief executive of the social media platform, a backlash against the billionaire less than two months after he took over in what has been a chaotic and controversial reign. Tonight, the results of Elon Musk's Twitter poll are in. He should step down as the social media giant's CEO, according to 57.5% of respondents. 
More than 17 million votes were cast in the unscientific survey, which Musk said he would abide by. Minutes after launching the survey, Musk tweeting, be careful what you wish, as you might get it. He was spotted over the weekend at the World Cup final in Doha. Just before creating the poll, Musk faced backlash for a new policy that had restricted some links to other social media platforms. That policy was deleted less than 24 hours after it was introduced. Musk tweeted that going forward, he would poll Twitter users about policy changes. After buying Twitter for $44 billion, Musk's time as CEO has been a whirlwind, marked by mass layoffs, abrupt policy changes, and account suspensions. Shares of Musk's other major company, Tesla, have plummeted more than 30% since he took over Twitter. That has left some observers to question whether this latest poll about Twitter's future could be an off-ramp for its controversial CEO. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Farming in the Democratic Republic of Congo's North Kivu province has been disrupted after M23 rebels seized lands in the region. The conflict has caused the prices of essentials to shoot up, threatening a hunger crisis. Taiwan's government has opened a probe into Chinese-owned social media platform TikTok on suspicion of illegally operating a subsidiary on the island, though the company's owner denied the accusations. Sam Bakhard said that she would settle defamation claims that were brought against her by ex-husband and fellow actor Johnny Depp, writing that the decision came after a great deal of deliberation. Thousands of ecstatic fans gave Argentina's football squad a hero's welcome in Buenos Aires after the plane carrying Lionel Messi and his World Cup winning teammates touched down at the Ezezia airport. On board Hawaiian Air Flight 35, dangerous turbulence left dozens injured, causing medics to declare a mass casualty emergency. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with the rowing Santas donning their Babo Natale outfits and racing down the Grand Canal to take part in the 12th edition of the colorful Christmas regatta. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.